the Polk R700. I did a video a couple weeks ago talking about my favorite speakers under $2,500. And toward the bottom of that list, but still in the list, was the Polk R500. And I had so many of you say, well, what about the R700? I think it's a great speaker. Okay, well, at the time, I hadn't had any experience with it, not for a lack of trying. And I don't like talking about things that I haven't reviewed myself or at the least heard somewhere. And I hadn't heard the R700, nor have I reviewed it until now. So thanks to you all for saying, where's the R700? I got the R700. It actually came from the manufacturer. So I reached out to the manufacturer and they sent me the R700 on loan to review. Let's start off with some specs and get that out of the way real fast. This speaker is a three-way design with a one inch ring radiator tweeter, a six and a half inch mid-range and two eight inch mid-base drivers. It is a ported enclosure with a down firing port at the very bottom of the enclosure. Nominal impedance is spec at eight ohm, but it's actually closer to four ohm. Frequency response sensitivity is stated at 88 decibels, which is actually pretty close to what I measured. Recommended amplifier power is about 50 to 300 watts for the manufacturer. Weight is about 78 pounds, which is roughly 35 kilograms. And height is about 45 inches or so, which is roughly 114 centimeters. These speakers come in two different flavors of color. One is what I would consider like a satin black finish. And then there is the walnut finish. Now the walnut finish I reviewed in some of the smaller bookshelf speakers, I think the walnut finish is probably the one to go for if you're looking for something that looks nicer, but maybe you're wanting to use these for a home theater type setup and you don't want any, any reflection off the speakers. If that's the case, then I would recommend going for the black. These speakers retail for about $2,200 per pair US dollars. I think they're currently on sale at Crutchfield for about $1,800. And speaking of Crutchfield, today's video is sponsored by Crutchfield. They wanted me to let you all know that they're having a major sale July 16th through 17th, right in competition with Amazon Prime. But I'm about to tell you why you should go to Crutchfield and not bother with Amazon this year. Ready? You just ordered a new TV on Amazon, you got it in, and you can't figure out the settings. What? Where the heck does this cable go? You ordered the sound bar, but no matter where you put it, below the TV, above the TV, it just doesn't sound right. Man, you done messed up. But Crutchfield, save the day. New speakers. Yay! You thought that new amp you got was fire. And you were right. Oh no, it's smoking. What do I do now? Well, that's easy. Call Crutchfield. They'll send you a replacement ASAP. You'll get a brand new toy and you'll be able to play again with all of your friends. In any DIY project, it's normal to hit a snag. That's why Crutchfield offers free tech support with every purchase. They can help you with complex wiring questions or something as simple as how to adjust the volume. Crutchfield has many knowledgeable employees who are there to help you solve any problem that may be thrown your way. So this year, before you hit that big old buy button on Amazon, make sure you jump over to Crutchfield and see what's going on. Not only do you get very good prices, very competitive with Amazon, but you get way better customer support. And to some of you, like me, that's very important. And don't be afraid to click the affiliate link below. It does earn me a small commission at no additional cost to you. And that allows me to keep doing what I'm doing here today. And I appreciate that. Let's get a couple things out of the way first. When I talk about distance from the wall, this is what I'm talking about. The back of the speaker to the wall behind the speaker. When I talk about aiming and on axis versus off axis, this is what I'm talking about. Zero degrees is always on axis. Any angle off of that would be considered off axis. When I talk about toe out, I'm talking about what you see in red versus black. So the black would be zero degrees and the red will be towed out 30 degrees. I'm just kind of giving you an idea of what I'm using in my terminology so it makes sense to you. Let's talk about the pros first. This speaker has very nice linearity. It's within about plus or minus two decibels pretty much throughout its entire range, except for obviously when the bass starts to roll off. And speaking of the bass, these speakers extend pretty dang low. The F3 anechoic which means without any room enforcement, is about 40 hertz. The F10 though is about 31 hertz, which means that it's gonna fall off pretty quickly. Do you need a subwoofer? I would say it depends. I mean, there's pretty much no case where I would recommend not using a subwoofer unless a speaker truly is full range. It gets all the way down to 20 hertz with authority. But in a case like this, you know, if you're using it for two channel listening, 
you probably don't have to have a subwoofer unless you listen to music that contains a lot of bass in that 30 hertz region, for example, rap or electronic music. One thing that stood out to me about these speakers was the broad radiation pattern. I really love the stereo effect of certain tracks. So when a track has something panned hard left or hard right, and you hear it go extend well beyond where the speakers are, I like that trickery. I just think that's neat. And that's one of my favorite things about stereo. These speakers with their very broad, broad, broad radiation pattern of about 70 degrees plus or minus, uh, it gives a very good sense of stage, and I like that personally. Now, some people may find that they prefer a speaker that has more narrow sound stage, or maybe they have a very lively room and they don't want a lot of reflections, so they shoot for a speaker that has a more narrow sound stage. I like a broader radiating speaker, and this one does that quite well. Another thing that I like about the speaker is that it has good low-level dynamics. A lot of people ask me about that, and that's kind of captured in my compression dynamic graphic that I usually show toward the end of my reviews. But I'll just go ahead and mention up front that at lower levels, you can still feel a nice solid thump out of these speakers, but it's not because anything is over-accentuated. I will say that I tried powering these speakers with a WIM amplifier. This is a $300 integrated and I just couldn't push it to the levels that I wanted. However, when pushing it with the Yamaha, which retails for like $3,000 as a two channel integrated, I had no problem driving these speakers and it brought out all sorts of life. I do have an ABX comparison review coming about that. I think you'll find that interesting. So stay tuned for that. Another pro is that it has very good control in terms of distortion and compression in the bass and the mid range. However, and this is where we're gonna flip over to the cons, the high frequency needs some work. Compared to other tower speakers that I've reviewed as of late, which to be fair, all are $5,000 or more, um, these just don't really do as well. And you'll see that in the data shortly. The other thing is that this speaker has pretty high compression and the high frequencies at the highest output. Now, to be honest, I don't know if that's gonna be a problem for you. I would say that if you listen at really high volume, then, maybe you're gonna notice a difference in terms of dynamic capability. And when I say really high volume, I'm talking like 100 decibels at three meters away, which is pretty dang loud and not something that I would recommend listening to for any extended period of time. But it's worth noting that that's one area where this speaker kind of falls down. And how do I put this? I guess it makes it humbled, if you will, compared to some of the other speakers that I reviewed lately which are two, three, four times the price. It kind of gives you an idea of, okay, this is where the trade-offs start to roll in. And again, you're gonna see that in the data. Another thing about this speaker that kind of bothers me is that there is an imbalance in the radiation pattern horizontally between the mid-range and the tweeter, where the tweeter kind of flares out. At around 50 to 70 degrees, it gets broader at about four kilohertz to five kilohertz. And sometimes that sounded a bit forward to me. Now I did try to do some in-room measurements and see exactly where that was, but I wasn't entirely sure, but based on what I was hearing, that's why I would say it's in that four to five kilohertz region. What you can do about that, add some side panel absorption to the room. I'll show you some ideas for that in the data below. The speaker also has a narrow vertical radiation response, which a lot of tower speakers and maybe two-way designs and sometimes three-way designs do especially compared to concentric coaxial designs where those are more broad vertically. So you're gonna have a little bit more trouble finding that sweet spot if you have multiple rows, maybe for a home theater. Otherwise, if you're just sitting in your normal two channel listening position or you just got one couch and you use these for home theater, shouldn't really be a problem. You have about plus or minus 15 degrees to work with, which should be adequate. My recommendation for the speaker is to bring it out into the room at least two feet. The reason I say that is because these things need room to breathe. They extend low, but unlike something like the Kef R5s, where they have a bit of a scooped mid-base response to allow you to put it closer to a wall, these are kind of flat through that mid-base region, which is a good thing, right? Like, But you just need to bring it out from the wall. Otherwise, you're gonna get a lot of boomy, exaggerated bass. That's the room's fault, not necessarily speaker but that's how best to use a speaker, bring it out from the wall about two feet. I would personally aim these between directly on axis at zero degrees or tow them out like maybe 20 degrees. So they're facing more into the room. 
I would not go beyond 20 degrees. And the reason I say that is because once you get past 20 degrees, that top end just starts falling pretty quickly due to the narrowing directivity of that ring radiator tweeter. So let's talk about the data that I got. And I'll use that to explain some of why I said what I said about the pros and the cons. First of all, all the data that you're about to see is captured using my Clippled Near Field Scanner in my garage. It allows me to get anechoic data in a non-anechoic environment. So I don't have to have a huge multi-million dollar complex with all sorts of foam capturing the reflections. I can use this bad boy in my garage, set them up, let them run for a few hours, come back, look at the data and figure out what about the speaker makes sense relative to my subjective interpretation. First of all, the impedance is actually kind of low. They market this as an eight ohm speaker, but as you can see, it's actually closer to a four ohm speaker. Frequency response looks good. You're within two to, well, I mean, you're within about two decibels of the on axis response all the way through. F3, as I said, 40 Hertz, F10, 31 Hertz, average sensitivity, 87.5 decibels. Really good overall response here. Not a lot to talk about, although there is a dip around 4K. Here is the CEA 2034 data set. Thing I'm gonna pay attention to is the early reflections directivity index, which gives me an idea of how EQable is the speaker. We see a dip around four kilohertz right here, which means that there's a directivity mismatch somewhere, either vertically or horizontally. Is it horizontal? Let's go back and see. Right through here, yep, that matches up. There's a horizontal mismatch. So what we're getting here is that the tweeter's coming in and it's broadening the radiation pattern compared to that six and a half inch mid-range. Estimated interim response, this looks pretty good. And if I throw a line on it, give you an idea of how I heard the speaker in the room, this is what we wind up with. Nice in-room extension to about mid 30 Hertz. The other thing I wanted to point out was on versus off axis yields very different high frequency response. So if we go to 10 kilohertz, we can see that there's about three to four decibels of difference, which is an indication that this ring radiator tweeter is narrowing up compared to maybe something like a wave guided tweeter or something of that nature, maybe like a coaxial type tweeter, which are also wave guided by that mid range. Those tend to hold their directivity pattern better than a standard dome tweeter or a standard ring radiator tweeter on a flat baffle. So this isn't really entirely new to me, but it seems more exaggerated because of the ring radiator instead of the dome. Dome tweeters don't seem to narrow up as quickly. So I say all that to say, remember earlier I talked about aiming the speaker between pointed directly at you at zero degrees versus towing them slightly off axis at 20, but not going beyond 20 degrees of the listener. This is why. If you go beyond 20 degrees, that high frequency is gonna start dropping off. And what you're gonna be left with is an apparent sound because this is all relative, right? It's gonna sound like this lower treble, upper mid range area is jumping out at you. And I think that's what I heard when I talked about that four to six K area, because I tried aiming the speakers pointed directly at me and off axis. And when I listened to them off axis pointed directly into the room, parallel with the back wall, that's when I noticed this exaggerated lower treble stand out more and more. As I pointed the speaker more toward me, the less that became an issue. This is the horizontal contour plot. You can see the speaker radiates at about plus or minus 70 degrees. Notice a couple things. Through the mid-range, you're narrowing, and then you're starting to get broader as that tweeter's brought in. This region right here is why I say that if you want to point the speaker out away from you at 30 degrees, you really should consider using some kind of acoustical absorption or at the least some sort of curtain in order to capture some of these reflections. The other thing is you can see this tweeter is narrowing pretty quickly once it gets beyond about eight, seven, eight kilohertz or so. Vertical response, as I said, about plus or minus 15 degrees reference from the tweeter. So make sure you're within about plus or minus 15 degrees of that tweeter. The closer to tweeter level you are, the better. Harmonic distortion to 86 decibels and then at 96 decibels. See around 7K, you're starting to break this 3% distortion threshold. But yeah, sometimes I wonder maybe if this wasn't the glare I was hearing. And it's hard for me to know for sure. That would require some kind of testing that I'm not capable of right now. But it's just something to consider if you're planning on listening to speakers at really high output level. Multi-tone distortion actually doesn't look as bad, right? At 96 decibels, it doesn't look as bad as we just saw with the harmonic. But then dynamic range compression testing. Look, mid bass, bass region, all good. I mean, these are really good, but then here comes that tweeter. Not here comes a tweeter. Doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> That's a Beatles reference. All right, the compressor ramps up pretty dang high. This is pretty dang high for compression testing. 
But if you look at the difference between 96 and 102 decibels, that's where the breakdown occurs. So at 96 decibels referenced at one meter, if you listen to these speakers in stereo pair, that's 102, because now you got two, you double the surface area and you double the power. Um, I think for most standard listening, you're gonna be fine. But if you really wanna rock out to these, or maybe you're gonna be sitting really far away, then this becomes more of an issue. For the most part though, I don't think that anybody's gonna have an issue with this, but I just kinda wanna explain what that could mean to you. A quick comparison. Now these are just my summary thoughts, okay? I'm gonna read them off to you. I'm not gonna show any graphics. If you wanna see that, aaronsaudiocorner.com, you can see all the graphics and do your own comparisons that way. The Kef R5 Meta, which retail for about $4,000 a pair. The Polk has better bass extension, but needs more distance from the wall. Kef is smoother than the high frequency handoff, but is more narrow at about plus or minus 50 degrees. So you may not find the sound as enveloping with the Kef as you do with the Polk. Kef has wider vertical consistency at about plus or minus 50 degrees. So you've got the leisure, I don't even think that's the right word, to walk around and listen to the music or whatever you want without having any shifts in tonality. If that matters to you, then most likely you're gonna wind up needing to go with a coaxial type speaker design because most other speaker designs don't have that broad of a vertical directivity. Polk has better distortion and compression in the low frequency, certainly the mid bass area, but it seems to have worse compression in the high frequency. Now let's compare it to the Klipsch RP8000F2. Those retail for about $1,500 a pair. Polk has better bass extension, almost gets an octave lower. Polk is smoother overall, just in terms of frequency response, it's much smoother. Polk is wider in the horizontal, 70 degrees versus 50 degrees on the Klipsch, but the Klipsch does have better high frequency dynamic range. I'd still take the Polk. That's just a personal opinion. Overall, this speaker represents, in my opinion, a very good value at $2,200 MSRP. And when it's found on sale, it's an even better value. With those little caveats I said earlier about the high output capability and maybe that sidewall reflection, if you can not worry about those two things, maybe they're not a big issue to you or you have curtains that you can put up on the sidewalls, it's a non-issue, really. Overall, for $2,200, I think these are gonna be pretty hard to beat and they're now gonna be in my top five under $2,500. That's it for this review. I appreciate you all watching. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them in the comment section below. I will talk to you all later. Take care. Peace.